three pace laps before we get a green flag here at the Cleveland Grand Prix, round eight of the PPG IndyCar World Series. And once again, you get a look at those flags in the background, see how the wind uh, is really affecting here. The drivers have not been out in the wind. It wasn't this blustery this morning, so they haven't really found out how that's going to affect them as they go down the back stretch. Let's take a look at the lineup for round eight of the PPG IndyCar World Series with the full rundown of the grid for you. And starting on the pole, as we said, Al Unser Jr. with a new lap record here. His third pole of the year alongside him, last year's winner, Paul Tracy. And then starting in the second row, Emerson Fittipaldi. He had a great race here last year to finish second. And alongside him, Nigel Mantle. They overtook each other seven times in two laps last year. On the inside of row three, Canadian Jacques Villeneuve. His first time here at Cleveland, the fastest in the warm-up. And Robbie Gordon alongside him, like I say, should be good in the rain. On the inside of row four, Mauricio Guzman. His first time here. And alongside him, Stefan Johansson with his best qualifying attempt this year. On the inside of row five, Arrivederci Mario on his last year tour. And alongside him, the Honda power plant of Bobby Rahal. On the inside of row six, Jimmy Vassar out of Discovery Bay, California. And Mark Smith out of Oregon alongside him. On the inside of row seven, from Milan, Italy, Teo Fabi. And from Mexico, Adrian Fernandez. On the inside of row eight, Canadian Scott Goodyear. And then the rookie, Brian Herter, who had a crash yesterday. On the inside of row nine, Michael Andretti. Alongside him, Dominic Dobson in the Pac West entry. On the inside of row 10, Raul Bosell, disappointing in qualifying for him. Alongside him, rookie Scott Sharp. On the inside of row 11, it's Mike Groff and Dutchman Harry Leyendijk. On the inside of row 12, Alessandro Zampedri had a great race in Portland last weekend. And Andrea Montemini racing with an injured left foot. On the inside of row 13, Hiro Matsushita and Marco Greco carries out that row. On 14, Willie T. Ribs on the inside, Parker Johnston in his Honda entry on the outside. On the inside of row 15, Giovanni Lavaghi, a rookie, and Ross Bentley out of Canada. And finally, it is uh, Jeff Wood starting from the back on row 16 on his own. 85 laps is 2.36 miles around this track. There are seven right-handers and three left-handers. The crucial overtaking areas will be going into, break, uh, into turn one under braking. And if you remember last year, we had a huge pileup there on the start. And they had a good uh, disciplinary meeting this morning, reminding everybody you've got to get through turn one to win this race. That's where we'll see most of the overtaking. Also coming out of turn eight under power as they shoot down towards the main start straight away. Coming out of eight is going to be a big area for overtaking. But that's going to be a case of getting the power down, which the Penske, as we've seen, are able to do that better than anybody else so far this year. Everybody else is trying to play catch-up as we have, I believe, one more lap under the yellow behind the pace car. We'll go green flag racing. Two pit stops today uh, for fuel and tyres. And, of course, if it rains, we'll see them come in and change for the, the uh, wet tyres. A lot of these teams do have wet tyres along the pit wall at the back of the pits and ready for any rain action they should get. is now in an alignment position going through the last chicane just before they come to the start finish line we watch for the green green is out though it seemed that Allenser Jr. got a bit of a start now let's take a look at him spread out wide well maybe they learned a little bit of a lesson from last year nope not everybody Michael in trouble Michael wasn't here last year so two cars together on the start Scott Goodyear is one of them. Michael Andretti is the other. So what I thought was going to happen into the first turn. Scott Goodyear back under power as we go back to the race itself. And Mansell has made his move and dropped into third place. Out in the east loop of this track. Now making the turn along the main grandstand. Ahead of them is a right, then a quick left. Alan Sir Jr., Fittipaldi, Mansell, and then Tracy. It is an interesting statistic that only once has a leader of the first lap of this race gone on to win it. Now here's the best place to pass. You can see Mansell going right down in there. He was feeling him out. He didn't pass there, but he's just going to try it pretty soon. Watch it because it's the easiest place on the track to do the passing. 
Strung out single file right now, but still in hot pursuit is Nigel Mansell, who also has much to prove today. This time last year, he already had a couple of wins under his belt. He really wishes he were in that position now. Mansell, by his standards, is having a terrible season. Winless, as you said. He had a foray into Formula One a couple of weeks ago in the French Grand Prix. He ran as high as third, but broke down. It's not the kind of season which Mansell, who thrives on success and the adrenaline it brings, is having. And has created ongoing speculation about where Mansell will drive next year. Will it be in the Indy cars? Or will it be in Formula One? The BBC is reporting today that Nigel Mansell will in fact be driving in Formula One next year. Well, Paul, I believe that, and I believe that you're going to see Michael Andretti in his car next year. But I think what you're seeing this year with the Lola cars versus the Penske's, which right there, the car on the right, was Mansell. The red and white cars, of course, are the Penske cars. And what you're seeing is the Penske cars are more flexible. They are racing these cars exactly the same way that they qualify them. And Mansell, for example, the Lola cars, they have a problem. They get them tuned up really good, but the cars are almost too finely tuned, and they can get out of tune on the chassis just real easy. Scott Goodyear, you saw, got back underway, and now Michael Andretti is underway as well, though he continues with a struggling season since that victory at the first race of the season in Australia, and for the second time in a row is the slowest of the Renard cars in qualifying here today and then his problem on the start itself. One of the reasons that you want to qualify high up, you don't want to get caught in a mid-pack incident. Nothing changes in the top four. You can watch also the vapor coming off the rear wings. Look at the wings right there on the right and the left-hand side of the wings. That's the vapor in the air. It's kind of chilly today. It's got a lot of moisture. Hits the wings and it shows you what the aerodynamics are doing with the car. This, of course, is one of the wide runways that I spoke of, but they go off this into a right-left S-bend, and that's where it's extremely rough, where the runway intersects the taxiway. Watching the rest of the field come through and centering up on Mauricio Guzelmi. We saw Robbie Gordon, Jack Villeneuve, and here is Guzelmi, who currently runs, trying to catch up with a Renard of Villeneuve. Watch the cars bounce. You can also see in this shot how close to the ground they get. The cars actually tip and touch the ground as they go through these turns, especially where it's really rough. Mario Andretti on his Arrivederci tour. I'll tell you what, every city he goes to, there's plenty of folks turning out. His car is just always surrounded. Johansson makes a move to the inside, shows himself to Andretti. But that's not a corner to pass. The next one is. Johansson in the blue and orange car. Back at the front, Mansell very much on the move now. This is Mansell's strongest show of the year. He was strong here last year, had a sensational battle with Emerson Fittipaldi. It shows that he obviously has a knack for this place. And I think one of the reasons for that, Paul and Bobby, is that he is able to dump the car into the turn and accelerate so hard out of the turn. It's a characteristic of his style and it really suits the way you have to drive this track. Well, you know, Sam and Paul, I don't know a driver in this race that doesn't really like the Cleveland track, except for that spot right there just on camera. They can make mistakes all over the place, and at least they normally don't have crashes from it. But you do get beaten up something bad. You walk up and down pit lane, and you see guys wearing, uh, you know, padding on their elbows and uh, uh, band-aids on their hands. Mansell closing on Paul Tracy. It is still Ellen's or Jr. Paul Tracy, Nigel Mansell, and then Emerson Fittipaldi. We may have suggested that Fittipaldi was in second place when in fact it is Paul Tracy. And Fittipaldi sits back and forth. And this is the battle on the track. These three cars right here. Fittipaldi waiting station. If you can say that at the kind of speeds the IndyCars turn. Fittipaldi is the most successful of all the drivers historically at this track with his three wins, most laps led. So you know he goes into the race with an extremely confident attitude, if perhaps not quite the speed of Al Unser Jr. and Paul Tracy, his teammates. You know, if you watch the bumps as the cars go around the track here, realize that the driver's seat, their rear ends, are only like an inch and a half from the ground. So when the car touches the ground, which it does, it has skid pads on the front and the back, it really hits the spines 
Now, Kittle Al has been in and out of the doctors all weekend because he's got problems with his spine from all the bumps here. Well, Scott Goodyear, as you know, had his problems on the start, went in and out of the pitch. Jack Arute, you have an update? Well, Paul, they checked after he had the problem on the start. Scott Goodyear came in, but on the way out after the mandatory check on the condition of the car, they found nothing wrong, but Goodyear exceeded the 80-mile-an-hour speed limit. So once again, he was brought into pit road that last lap, and he was given what's called a stop-and-wait penalty. A stop for five seconds, and then he was sent back on his way. Things are not going well for the Budweiser crew. Let's check in with Gary Gerald. Well, Jack, as far as Michael Andretti is concerned, who was involved in that incident on the green flag in turn number one, the crew expected once Michael got restarted that he would come in. They laid out fresh tires over the wall, but Michael stayed on course. So obviously the car has responded okay. He just lost a considerable amount of time. He stays out there now at the back of the pack. Well, of course, Scott Goodyear this uh, weekend, oh, we see Jimmy, Jimmy Vassar had an onboard fire. Back. Second race in a row, he is out very early. Too bad for Jimmy Vassar, the driver that can take a STP car. He's really an upcoming driver and really looks good this year at the shame. One thing we should perhaps say about that stop and wait penalty, if you have a stop and go here at Cleveland, you can actually get out on the course and gain position because of the nature of the layout of the pits. So when they bring him in for a stop and go, they'll also hold him sometime to make the penalty a valid penalty. Al Unser Jr., car 31, leads here, followed by his teammate Paul Tracy with Nigel Mansell doing everything he can to close in. And the leaders are already encountering the slower traffic. Back at the Grand Prix of Cleveland, presented by Goodyear, as we watch the leader, Al Unser Jr., he is running a dominant race once again here. In second place is Paul Tracy. Nigel Mansell is third. Emerson Fittipaldi is fourth. Nothing has changed there. Jimmy Vassar is out of the race. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, a season that started with such great promise for Jimmy Vassar has taken a nosedive. What was the problem today, Jimmy? Well, uh, just started the race. I don't know what lap it was early in the race. The engine just cut out, and uh, I looked down the dash, and it said fuel alarm. So something, something malfunctioned somewhere in the car that just lost power. Uh, we started out good this season, and uh, we're hitting a little soft spot now, but it's, it's definitely not a nosedive, Gary. Okay, well, they're seventh in points coming in. Disappointed. Next week in Toronto, better fortune. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we're going to come back. we got a great team here, and, uh, you know, that's, that's racing. So uh, we'll get them next time. Thanks. Paul? I think the good report is there that there is no fire. Probably one of the observers saw some smoke from something that overheats as soon as the car comes to a rest but at least they don't have a lot of damage to rebuild. Yeah, I just want to remind everybody to look at the bottom of the cars if you want to see what the suspensions go through on these race cars, how rough it is, how short of travel they have to have. Just watch the underneath the cars and you can see the daylight to the point where they look like they're touching. It's interesting to watch this. Also, as you're watching the cars closely, remember that the exciting thing about the season so far has been the superiority of the Penske's, and in particular, what has made the Penske's better? The talk is that it's their traction off the turns, that they get better acceleration off the turn. Watch for that here. Mansell's been unable to match it in qualifying in practice. Now he seems to have traction identical to there. In this track, Sam seems to emphasize itself on shock absorbers more than any other track. Just watch the underneath of the cars again and imagine it's not so much the body moving as it is the tire.